Hello everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for today's sermon from Praise Assembly of God here at 89 Congress Street. Hope you enjoy this message and if you have any feedback you'd like to offer feel free to give me a call at 207-364-3856 or my cell phone 207-357-4748. Again, enjoy today's message. Thanks. We heard from Christopher now we're going to hear from Christopher's mom and then dad. But Elizabeth's going to come and she's going to sing uh, for us here tonight a very, very special song. So uh, we're ready for you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Amen. My name is Elizabeth Truworthy, and we are missionaries to Mexico, like um, most of you have heard uh, since we've been here this weekend. Uh, the other churches that are here with us tonight, um, my husband, who will be giving the word, and my son, who is Christopher, the one being introduced. We are missionaries in Mexico. We um, have been living there for the past, what, going on three years this July. Except for right now that we're over here. But we have our home and everything over there. At the end of service, you all are welcome to stop by our table. Anyways, parentheses closed. Number seven, I hope you all enjoy this. And in the chorus, I will interject the Spanish part of it just so you guys can hear it, okay? It's just the chorus.
Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander, and my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior.
Bible says the Lord is from the east, as far as the east is from the west, without borders. Amen. The, um, I forgot to mention earlier, at the end of the service, uh, we're going to be uh, taking a special love offering for the True Worthy family, so please keep that in mind. Uh, but we, we love to do that at the end, once everyone gets to feel the heart and passion of the ministry. Uh, and missions is the heartbeat of God, we believe. And in Mexico, there are millions there that need Jesus Christ. And uh, we want to do our part in supporting them. So that will be uh, at the conclude, conclusion of the service and before we uh, move uh, into the fellowship area uh, for time of, of the fellowship and meal. Uh, tonight. So Brother Chris, why don't you come? Chris is a wonderful man of God. And uh, he's, he's uh, loves the Lord. Sharing uh, with some presentation and word here tonight. Thank you, Pastor. It's a pleasure to be here again. We're wrapping up this uh, crusade. And it's a pleasure to be here and to fellowship with all the different churches. This is something that's not really... Um, abnormal for me because I'm a member we're uh, members of World Indigenous Mission uh, in Mexico and our missions agency's core belief is kingdom principle, one of them, four. Uh, and we work all across denominational borders. I preach in Presbyterian churches, Baptist churches, Pentecostal churches, Methodist churches. It doesn't matter the dom denomination. We are uh, passionate about building the kingdom of God. Um, if you could shut these lights up, I think it might help the people be able to see the screen. Um, so we've been uh, members with World Indigenous Missions since uh, 2011. Um, and we've been working in Mexico since July 10th of 2012, um, we moved our family down, I moved my family down there, we didn't really have much to give up, we, we never owned any house or, or had any debt that way, so that way it was easy for us, we just picked up and moved down there. Um, this is our mission statement, making the least reached the most reached by empowering the Mexican church to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ. And how we do this, I like what it says in the New English translation, Colossians 1.28, we proclaim him by instructing and teaching all people with all wisdom so that we may present every person mature in Christ. We uh, graduated from our two-year apprenticeship this past uh, July, and the Lord has given us direction that we are going to take 15 days and go into uh, we are residing right uh, there in Cuernavaca. You can't really see the name. It's like an hour south of Mexico City. We work in Puebla, Oaxaca, Guerrero, and Michoacan. The Lord has opened up doors for us with different pastors. We come in alongside of the pastors. World Indigenous Missions does not have any churches. We believe in indigenous principle, that they should be self-governing, self-propagating, and self-sustaining. We do not give them money. They raise up the money so that they can stay there. We just give them the tools and the ability to be able to do it. We, we work in Guerrero down here in the Costa Rica. We work over here in uh, Oaxaca and in Puebla, just here in Tehuacan and meet what God over in this area. The vision that God has given us is to take 15 days, go and disciple, like in, for example, in Michoacan, amongst the Purepecha. And after we're done with the 15 days, we'll go home and recuperate for 15 days and get ourselves together, and then we'll go to Guerrero. And we'll disciple them for 15 days. Go back home for 15 days, recuperate, and, and get ourselves together again. Then we'll go to Oaxaca disciple them and, and train alongside the, the pastors there and we'll go back home 
and then go to Puebla. <laughs> At the end of this circuit, because God's only opened four doors right now, we'll go back to the first door just to see if I didn't communicate correctly because I'm a human being, I'm not perfect, and maybe they didn't understand something that I was communicating and to shore that foundation up and teach them something more to build upon it. A lot of the pastors have told us that they want teaching, uh, basic teaching, like teach the people how to study the Bible. Um, uh, Bibles are extremely expensive there. To get a good study Bible, they have to pay nearly a thousand pesos. That's, that's uh, like 80 to 90 dollars, uh, and that, that's expensive for them. Uh, here we come across some study Bibles that we can get for 60 bucks, shipping and handling. Uh, that we have actually donated uh, a couple of them in Michoacan, and it really helped the indigenous pastors and enhanced their preaching. Um, that's all we're about. Discipleship, evangelizing, and working alongside these pastors. Um, and that's our uh, desire. I'm going to enhance on what I spoke on this morning, Pastor Justin. How do you construct a rope? It's constructed of many different strands. All the individual peoples in your local churches are the strands. Or the individual cords. Or, or, or. And then you wind them together and you get a strand. Your, those family cords in your church, they're the strand. And then you have all those strands that come together and form a rope. There's always a cord, and it should be wrapped around the cord, Jesus Christ. So every church that's represented here, whether it's Nazarene, Baptist, Pentecostal, Methodist, Presbyterian, we have the core that Jesus Christ, why can't we bind together? Yeah. And form a net. Because one church can't reach all the River Valley, and one church cannot reach all of Mexico. That's why World Indigenous Mission believes in kingdom principles and inter-networking and working with all these other churches and pastors to form a net so that we don't have this. And right now, in a lot of places, we have this. We have hold because of prejudice, really. It's prejudice. No, I'm not like that fella down there. He goes to the Baptist church. It's prejudice. Arrogance. Criticism, all of this stuff rips up the net and we can't catch fish. How many fish can you catch with just one line? <laughs> Unless you put more than one hook on the line, but that's why we need, whoops, that's why we need a net <coughs> so that we can reap the harvest. And we as a missionary family, uh, we want to partner with churches like yourself so that we can bring in the harvest together. I can't do it by myself. I'm one person. And I've had a call on my life since I was eight years old for the nation. And I asked God, why do you call me to Mexico if I'm called to the nation? Why Mexico? Well, there's 324 different people groups in Mexico. Alone, and 65 of those different of them people groups are not. Uh, they're in the least reached. You got the Jews. There's 41,000 Jews in Mexico, unevangelized. Uh, there's the Perepecha. There's uh, the Aztecs. There's uh, Amusco. Uh, there's all different indigenous. There's Arab, <laughs> Muslim, in Mexico. And that's why we have the vision, the vision statement that we have, and this is why we work together. I want to throw this in there. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthily of the calling which you have been called with all humility. Amen. What creates the whole? Lack of humility. Right. And gentleness. With patience. Christ has been very patient with many of us, but we can't be patient with our brother and sister that we a little different. Bearing with one another in love. 
making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Wow, that right there slaps us around, I know. Making every effort. I like how it says it in Spanish, it's a little bit stronger. It, it, it talks about forcing yourself to keep the unity of the Spirit. There is one body, one Spirit, just as you two were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, and through all, and in all. We like to have several different little kingdoms with all these little different kings, but it, when we get to heaven, it's only going to be, it's not going to be a Baptist corner, there's not going to be a Nazarene corner, there's not going to be a Methodist corner, it's not going to be a Mexican corner, there's not going to be an African Nigerian corner, there's not going to be an Iraqi corner, there's not going to be an Afghanistan corner. When John the Beloved saw in Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, he saw the nation worshipping before the throne of God. How could he tell that there were different nations? God didn't make them all look the same. He kept the, the differences. So that John could distinguish that it was different people they were worshiping. You ever think about that? But we major on the minor, which is the differences, and we, it brings divisions. I like what Psalms 133 says. It says in the end, after it says, Blessed are the brethren who dwell together in harmony or in unity. But in the end, the last verse, it says, There commands the Lord the blessing and life everlasting. Maybe we don't have the blessing that we need here in the River Valley or in the United States or in Mexico because we're too divided and we're not dwelling together in unity. I pray that this challenges you as churches to go a little deeper in your unity. I'm excited that the pastor here, uh, my brother, talked about the children outreach. And I hope every one of you churches get involved with that. In Mexico, I'm blessed to be a part of uh, an alianza or an alliance of pastors of more than 200 churches, Baptists. Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, and they organize events together. We just had one back in November in the Socorro, in the, in the center of Mexico, uh, of Cuernavaca, to pray for the government and to pray for Morelos. Because they understand that the only way to bring a change to Mexico is if they pray for their authorities and their leaders. And there were Baptists up, Baptist people, pastors up there leading the congregation in prayer. Presbyterian pastors coming up and leading the congregation in prayer. They gave them different points to pray on and to pray and intercede. Right out in public, under the sun, in unity. And to tell you the truth, the testimony of Morelos is more calm and tranquilo than the rest of the country. And I believe it's because of the alliance in Morelos. I can tell you in Guerrero, especially I talked to the pastor in Acapulco, he said, no, we got like three alliances. It all came out of one. They can't agree on anything. So band together, brothers. I'm excited yeah. with what's going on here. You can turn that off. Um, I'm excited. Um, pass by our table. Please, your pastors, take some of them prayer cards just to pray for us. And remember us in prayer, please. Because we're your hands and feet. Whether it's by prayer or finances, it doesn't matter. Uh, we need prayer support. And for me, prayer support is more important than finances. Because if it isn't for the prayer, I ain't going to have the power of the Holy Spirit and, and the grace of God to be able to accomplish what we need to accomplish. Because this mission statement that God has given me is too big for me to accomplish by myself. Too big for me to accomplish by myself. With no further ado, let's go to the Lord in prayer. We can never pray too much, amen? amen. 
And let's ask the Lord to continue to move in this service and to allow his blessing to rest upon us. Father, we thank you for your presence here tonight. Your word says where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you are. And we know that you're not a man that you should lie. You're true to your word. You said in your word also that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you, Father, that we can stand on your word because it is more sure than anything because you said heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle of your word will fail. Father, we ask that you would move by your spirit continually in the hearts of the people here tonight. We ask that you would quicken their ears to hear what the spirit would say to the church, quicken their hearts and soften their hearts to be able to receive the word of the Lord. And I pray, Father, that you would touch my mind and quicken my mind to be able to clearly and effectively and efficiently express the word that you placed upon my heart and mind. Quicken my tongue that I may be able to speak as an oracle of God and minister in the ability which you give me so that you can be glorified. I do not want Chris Trueworthy to be lifted up. Lord, I want Jesus Christ to be magnified here tonight. And I pray, Father, that you would move by your spirit and be magnified in every word that is brought forth and enable us to receive it. And we'll give you the praise and the glory for it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. amen. And amen. If you have your Bible tonight, turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. I'm reading from the New American Standard. I don't know what translation you all have, but try to follow along as best as you can. The word of the Lord reads, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above. Where Christ is, Seated at the right hand of God. And set your mind on things above. And not on things on the earth. Keep seeking the things that are above. What you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. C.S. Lewis said that in his book, The Magician's Nephew. What you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you are standing. And it also depends on what sort of person you are. What we believe is important because wrong thinking leads to wrong action and misplaced priorities. Have you ever seen a driver driving down the road? And they're weaving back and forth, bouncing from yellow line to white line. They're distracted by something going on in the cab or in day, this day and age. They're texting or talking on the phone. And they're not putting their attention on the road ahead. We drive where we look. We drive where we look. If we maintain our focus ahead, we're going to drive ahead. We're going to drive straight. But if we're looking all over the place... We're going to drive like that. The same principle applies to our spiritual life. Where we look or what we are looking at will determine the direction of our growth spiritually. Golf, the golf uh, famous uh, Arnold Palmer recalls a lesson about overconfidence. It was the final hole of the 1961 Masters competition in the Masters tournament. And I had one stroke and a lead had just hit a very satisfying tee shot. I felt I was in a pretty good, in pretty good shape. As I approached my ball, I saw an old friend standing at the edge of the gallery. He motioned me over and stuck out his hand and said, congratulations. I took his hand and shook it, but as soon as I did, I knew I had lost my focus. 
On my next two shots, I hit the ball into the sand hole. Then I put it over the edge of the green. And I missed a putt and lost the Masters. You don't forget a mistake like that. You just learn from it and become determined that you will never do it again. And I haven't in the 30 years since. This was written by, in the book, Carol Mann, uh, the 19th hole. And Reader's Digest quoted this. Have we lost our focus? What are we looking at? We've been learning this weekend to maintain our focus so that we can reach out to others and really serve others in the community, making ourselves rapture ready and others as well. I want to talk to you tonight about the subject of this question and have you meditate on it tonight. Which are you? A chicken? Or an eagle? Are you a chicken? Or are you an eagle? A chicken is preoccupied with the temporary things, the problems and the struggles here in the world. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4 says, Do not weary yourself to gain wealth. Cease from the consideration of it. There's a lot of people that have lost their families, that have lost their friends, entered into divorce because they weary themselves with gain. Now, wealth is not bad in itself, but Paul said the love of money is the root of all evil. The dollar bill is not bad, but it's the love of that more than anything else. And this is what Solomon is talking about when we weary ourselves to gain wealth. He says, cease from the consideration of it. That's what a chicken does. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Instruct the, wit, the rich not to be con conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. If you study history, how many people jumped out of the buildings in, in, in that uh, uh, day of the turn of the century when the stock market fell for the first time back in the Depression and all of that, people just leaped for their lives because they had their hope in the uncertainty of this economy in this world. God's economy is not unstable like this economy. He doesn't base his economy on the economy of these things here. And we need to keep our focus on things in heaven and not be focused on things here in the earth. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Uh, Let's read it. Matthew chapter 6. Verses 19 through 21, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on the earth, where moth and rust does destroy, and where thieves break into steel. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be all. A chicken. How does a chicken walk around the barnyard? They're always looking down, looking at the, at the dirt. <coughs> and when they fly, they don't fly very far because they don't really look up. They're always looking down. How many times do we as people have heard it or maybe we participated in it? Oh, woe is me. We're picking at the dirt. I don't know how I'm going to make it through. With complaining and criticizing and pointing fingers instead of looking up. A chicken is self-centered. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 4 says, I have seen that every labor and every skill which is done is the result of rivalry between a man and his neighbor. This too is vanity 
and striving for after the wind. Competing with the Joneses. Romans chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Romans chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, Wrath and indignation. The Bible tells us numerous times, we read it in Ephesians chapter 4, tolerating one another, preferring one another. We need to love our neighbor like we love ourselves. Amen. Amen. If we did that, that would solve a lot of problems. But because of our arrogance, because of our self-centeredness, and looking inward instead of outward, we cannot prefer others. It's my way or the highway, baby. There's the door, don't let it hit you with a good Lord spit you. <laughs> That's the selfish attitude in the culture today. I'm sorry if it offends you to say it like that, but that's the way people live. Listen to the commercials of McDonald's and Burger King. Have it your way. Everything in this culture is focused on having it your way. In American culture, we cannot suffer more than five minutes in a line. You wouldn't make it in Mexico, I'm telling you. Just to renew your driver's license down there, you wait about three, four hours. And you bounce from one station to another station. It's like a three-ring circuit. You go here and get this piece of paper, and then you go over here, and then you, you enter the information in, and then you go over here, and then you pay, and then you go back over here, and you sit and wait till they call you, they take your picture, and then finally you wait again until they give you the little piece of plastic. And four hours later, you got your license. Chickens have a narrow vision. How many of you know the illustration of Samson? What did he do? He played around with sin and lost his eyesight. That's an illustration of getting sidetracked, being selfish. And he lost his vision. And to the shame, he had to kill himself to take out the enemy. Because he didn't adhere to what God had said. Think about it. In James chapter 1 verse 25. James chapter 1 verse 25. James chapter 1 verse 25. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. When we have a narrow vision, it goes in one ear and out the other. A sad testimony in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, when Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli, and the word from the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were infrequent. How was the leadership that day, Eli? How was his son acting that day? It was shameful. They were spiritual leaders of that day. And visions were infrequent. No wonder. The leadership was in no place to hear what God had to say or to see what direction God wanted to go in. They were playing the role of a chicken. 
strutting around the barnyard concerned with what they could get to fuel their selfish intents and selfish desires. And God had to raise up a young boy, Samuel. Chickens have a lack of maturity. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, Paul says, I gave you milk to drink and not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able. Lack of maturity. Babies drink milk. When we grow and we develop our teeth, we begin to eat more solid food. 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Be mature. What does it say in 1 Corinthians 13? When I was a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, I acted as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Love and the fruit of the Spirit, that brings about maturity. When we're mature with self, we should be self-controlled. We should be temperate. We should be gentle. We should be understanding so that we can keep the unity amongst our Christian brethren in the same church and across denominational lines. But when we get the chickens out or the roosters, what does the rooster do? We got a lot of roosters in, in Mexico. <laughs> they put that chest out there and they toot their own horn. The arrogance of a rooster. Nobody else can take my hands. I'm going to claw them to death. <laughs> Get out of my barnyard or I'm going to claw you to death. Competition. Toot no own horn. The arrogance. Lack of preferring one another. It's a lack of maturity. It's the mentality of a chicken. Only by the work of Christ did on the cross we can be free. We must put our faith in what he did for us on the cross. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We are saved by grace through faith. It's not a work lest any man should fold. That's the core of all of our foundation in, in, in faith. And we should come together in unity. Our motive to work should come from our faith in Christ. We will live out what we believe. James chapter 2 verses 14 through 26 talks about it. Faith without works is dead. If I really have true pure faith in what this word says, I'm going to live it out. And if I really don't believe it, like I talked about this morning, if I just believe this was penned by men and it's antiquated, I'm going to live it out. I'm going to live it out that way. And if I don't believe Jesus Christ could come at any moment, I'm going to live that way. I'm not going to love my neighbor as myself. I'm not going to be found doing like the faithful servant when the master comes. I'm going to be found wanting. The eagle thinks on eternal things. Psalm 55 verse 22. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. This is an individual who is looking upward, who's not picking at the dirt, who's not picking at the problem, who's not focused inward, but focused upward. It's got his focus on Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. Luke 12, 22 and 30, 23 and he said to his disciples, For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, nor for your body as to what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. When we are heavenly minded, and like it says in Colossians, and we are seeking the things of God and seeking the things above, we're not going to be worried about what we're going to eat. You may say you're out of touch, Chris. 
No, I'm not. I live that way. I don't worry about what's in the checking account. I keep tabs on it. I don't spend unwisely. But I don't worry about it because we're living by faith. We're living by by the support of, of what our brothers and sisters can give us. We traveled over 3,000 miles to get here. In that Ford Escape out there that's got the purple tag that says Morelos. When we got to Laredo, Texas, and I'm not just saying this to, to, to brag or anything, I'm telling this to you to, to understand the provision of our Father. When we are in the will of the Lord and we are following after Him and we trust Him with childlike faith, we got to Laredo, Texas, and that's only 16 hours from our home. All we had in our checking account was $47. We still had another 2,550 miles to get to Maine. You cannot drive 2,550 miles on $47. But the Lord raised up. I had one service in a church that's smaller than this one. And every time I preached there, they've only given me an offering of $100, but they doubled it. But still, I can't get here on $247. The Lord raised up other individuals that had no idea. I didn't talk to nobody. I told my wife and that was it. And I said, don't you dare say anything to your family or to my family what we got going, going on here. God is going to get us to Maine. And I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's going to do it. And God raised up the resources. And look, I'm here. looking down, but we need to look upward. If we would begin to look upward, like Abraham, a hope against all hope. And it wasn't logical for a 99-year-old man and a 100-year-old, I mean a 100-year-old man and a 99-year-old woman to have children. It was against all natural logic. But they had hope. Biblical hope is an anticipation, an expectation with pleasure that they're going to receive. It's not the hope that we hear about today. Well, I hope so, but most likely it ain't going to happen. No, biblical hope is a faith. It's a conviction. Something that we're willing to die for. Something that we're willing to lay our lives down. That's why all these Christian martyrs stand up against the Muslims and say, I will not deny my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Take my head off. We need to have that hope. And we need to be like an eagle and think on eternal things. We need to be Christ-centered. Like it says in Hebrews 12 too, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher or the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He was a human being just like you and me. He prayed, Father, if, it, if you can, let this cup pass from me. He sweat drops of blood. He wrestled with his humanity to do the will of God. And as an example for us, we need to follow that and take up our cross. Suffer what we must suffer. Endure what we must endure. Because we have a Christ-centered focus. As an eagle, we fly above the storm. And the problems begin to look as God's perspective. Very small. How do you think King David, before he was a king, was able to stand as a little teenager before the giant? And say, I come in a sling. In the name of Jehovah, in the name of the Lord. And this battle is not mine, but it's the Lord. I am going to cut your head off and feed your carcass to the birds. 
How do you think a young boy could say something like that? It's not logical. But we need to get all this logic out of our heads, all of this rationale out of our head, and start taking the scriptures and start living like the men and women of old. That's how we're going to see the River Valley transformed and people set free from drugs and alcohol and all these vices that are controlling their lives. That's how we're going to see Mexico transformed, and they're going to become a mission-sending uh, nation. 1 John 3.3 3 says, And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, I love this scripture, purifies himself just as he is pure. Maybe we're looking at our sinful problem too much. We need to change the direction of our attention and our energy to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The scripture says it. He who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself even as he is pure. That's not my word. That's God's word. you got an issue with that. Take it up with him. There's more freedom in the scriptures than what we realize. And if we would begin to soar with wings as eagles and begin to view this lifestyle like a child, why do you think he said, unless we become like children, we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. When I tell my son I have something for him, he waits with an expectation to receive. And he doesn't question. Because he knows puppy is going to deliver He's a child, only 10 years old. But we adults, we rationalize, oh, well, you know, we compare God to human beings. God's not a man that he should lie. An eagle has an ample vision. An eagle has an ample vision. Let's go to Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. The Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, and it hastens towards the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come and will not delay. Behold, as for, for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by his faith. Or live by faith. We are justified by faith. We can take this principle, yes, it's the word of the Lord speaking to Habakkuk, but we can take this principle that when God speaks something to us from the Holy Scriptures and it looks impossible like it's not going to come to pass, we can bank on it. We need to live by our faith. Or as it says in some translations, the faith of God. Because it says in, in Romans, it quotes from this, the just shall live by faith. And in the original Greek, it means the faith of God. Does God doubt? Does he question himself? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But the problem is, we mix it all up with human reasoning and rationale. A, 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 a eagle has maturity. Let's flip over to Galatians chapter 5 verses 20 through 22 through 26. And then we're going to end up with, with back at our, in, our, in the book of our text. Galatians chapter 5 verses 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh 
with its passions and desires. And if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Ouch. That's the major problem of a lot of divisions in the church. We're challenging one another in the wrong spirit. There's a right way to challenge one another, and there's a wrong way. Because it does say in the scriptures, iron sharpens iron. But what happens when you strike iron against itself too long and too hard? Dulls it, yeah? What else happens? You can start a fire, right? And usually that's what happens. We start fires and there's a conflict and everybody involved gets burned. But you know, if you want to sharpen a knife, you put it to a whetstone. The Word of God and the Holy Spirit, what's the symbol of that in the Scripture? Water. If we would deal with that situation by the water of the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit, we would sharpen one another instead of dulling one another and burning one another. Amen. We need to be in the business of building bridges, not burning bridges. Amen. And the best bridge that was built was through the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. And if we can agree and cross over on that bridge, we will have a net that we can reap a harvest. And our churches will be healthy, producing fruit, growing, and maturing. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Colossians chapter 2, and I'm winding down. Verses 2 and 3. That their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding resulting in the true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. We are built up in Christ. Christ is the source. You know, if we would look at our brothers and sisters, whether Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, they just got a little, we all just got a little piece of the puzzle. And if we would come together really and put the pieces of the puzzle together, we would really begin to see the ample vision of the full gospel of God. Amen. An eagle, when they fly, they can see the whole picture. But the problem is we've been lingering in the barnyard too long. People get saved, we're done and over. Because God, as it says in Psalm 133, blesses where we live in harmony. Are we a chicken? Picking at one another, looking down instead of looking up, lacking maturity, or are we an eagle? It's going to take eagles to reach this river valley. And I believe many of you have the desires and the potential of being full of eagles. God is making a network, and a fisherman's net right here. But don't just settle for this once a month fellowship. Let God open up your imagination and really get in the trenches and work with one another. Help one another out. Like C.S. Lewis said when I opened up, what you see and what you hear depends a great deal on where you are standing, and it also depends on what sort of person you are. What sort of person are you? The glory of God is connected to our suffering and death to self. The death of our goals, ambitions, desires, and passions, etc., etc., etc. John 33 verse 30 says, He must increase and I must decrease. True Christianity in its fundamental conflict with the ways of the world, which are often the ways of the crowd. 
True Christianity is in fundamental conflict. We're going to have conflict with the world. We're not of the world. We're in the world. It takes two wings for an eagle to fly. If an eagle were to try to fly with just one wing, he would only spin around in circles on the ground. The same is true with many people who are trying to soar spiritually on their faith, but they have not added patience. They just keep going round and round in circles and getting more and more frustrating, kicking up a lot of dust. Any truth that we teach without this counterbalancing truth will lead us to frustration and not fulfillment. Rick Joyner said that. We must have two wings to fly. And we must be faith balanced with patience. And what is love? Patience. We lack patience, we lack love. And if we lack love, we lack God. For God is love. Everybody stand. I'm going to do something different. It may be on one of the Orthodox, but some of you get going up and, and pray. I'd like to have all the pastors from different churches come down front here, please. I feel it led by the Holy Spirit to pray. All the pastors from the different churches, come on down front here. I want to pray for you all. All the is there any other leaders from other churches? Is that all of them? I'm going to pray that the Lord will move in a manner because everything seems to rise and fall on leadership. And the people are going to emulate what they see in the leadership. And if there's no unity amongst the leadership, there cannot be unity amongst the body. I believe, now I'm understanding why I fought such a... Remember, baby, when we were talking about... We fought a battle to get here. Baby. And I don't think the enemy really wanted this message to be preached. I don't believe in coincidences. God orchestrated this before the foundations of the world for this message to be preached. Because he wants unity to come to us. A true unity, the heart of Christ. And I just feel led to pray a prayer, and I want all the body to agree with me for the leadership. Pray and intercede for our leaders. These are spiritual leaders. They represent the spiritual leaders, the priesthood, under Christ. Christ is the shepherd, and they are under Christ. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus. Father, I just pray right now that you would move by your spirit in these leaders, these pastors. Lord, I pray that they would have a camaraderie, a friendship, like David and Jonathan. A unity that cannot be broken even though Saul the father tried to divide David and Jonathan. Their love one for another would not allow it to be separated. Lord, I pray that that love, that baptism of love would take place in these brethren. That they would see each other as brethren in a greater way than what they already do. And I pray, Father, that the unity would begin to flow through the congregation. And that power of your Holy Spirit and love would flow through this river valley, like this river here that is, when it gets overflowing from the winter melt with a torrential rain, and flood this valley with your glory. That souls would be saved, and the kingdom would be built. And people would be set free from drugs and alcohol. The broken homes would be put together. And all of the problems and struggles here, even the economic problems, 
They all stem from the same root. A lack of Jesus. Lord, help us to bind together and construct a net strong that we can reap the harvest not only here in the River Valley, but the fire and the blaze would grow to the rest of this state. Why can't it start here, Lord? Why not can't it start here in Rumford, in Mexico, Maine, in Peru, in these other surrounding towns? Why can't it start here, Lord? I ask you humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, your son, let your favor rest upon these men. Heal the wounds. Because leaders suffer wounds and many times they don't say anything. Lord, heal the wounds. Pour in the healing balm of Gilead. Open up their vision to be more amplified. Give them creativity they've never had before. Where they can work together in a network to reap the harvest, Father. And we give you the praise and the glory for it. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thanks for watching today's message. Appreciate you taking the time to listen to each word of God as shared here today. I'd also like to take this time to invite you to our weekly services. Sunday school for all ages at 9 a.m. Worship at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. with Children's Church at 10 a.m. Also, we have a special men's and women's group at 5 p.m. on Sundays. During the week, we have several services as well. We have an extra innings class with me, Pastor Justin, on Tuesdays at 10. Uh, also, uh, Tuesday nights at 7 p.m., we have a special class on Israel and the Book of Acts. Wednesday, we have a love and respect class for married couples at 10 a.m. Also, on Wednesday night, we have our family night for all ages at 6.30 p.m. And lastly, we have our food pantry on Thursdays with servings at both 10 and 11 a.m. May God richly bless you today. Thanks again for watching.